Hello, my name is Todd Weber from Energy Balanced Nutrition Consulting, and today I want to answer a commonly asked question. Will eating carbs make me fat? To answer that question, I would say, in general, no. And here is how we know why the answer is no. In the typical American diet, we consume around 2200 calories a day. Roughly 50% of those calories come from carbohydrate. When we convert carbohydrate calories to grams of carbohydrate, we see that on average, we consume about 275 grams of carbohydrate per day. Please keep this number in mind. Next, we must consider the fact that carbohydrate has two basic fates. We're either going to burn it for fuel, or we're going to store it for later. As you can see in the blue headings, the food we eat is stored as either carbohydrates or fats. If we focus on the top table, we can see that the body stores carbohydrates as a substance called glycogen in the liver and in the muscle. For a 140 pound individual, he or she can store around 625 grams of carbohydrate. Can you recall how many grams of carbohydrate we typically eat in one day? The answer is 275. Our bodies can store twice as much carbohydrate as we eat in one day. We'll talk about the table on the bottom of the screen on fat storage later on. But first I want to get into the Wayback Machine and talk about a study that was published way back in 1982 and helped to answer the question of, will eating carbs make me fat? If we eat too many carbohydrates, will the excess carbs be stored as fat? To answer this question, researchers had research participants consume close to 500 grams of carbohydrate in the form of bread, jam, and juice, with a little fat added in as well. Spoiler alert! What the researchers found is that even when massive amounts of carbohydrate are consumed, carbs are not converted to fat, i.e. eating too many carbs will not make you fat. Now let's take a closer look at the researchers' findings. In the far left-hand column, you see the subject's initials. In the next column, we see the amount of carbohydrate ingested was proportional to the subject's body mass and nearly averaged 500 grams. Substrate oxidation is a fancy way of saying how many calories were burned in terms of grams. CHO conversion to glycogen shows us how much carbohydrate was stored as carbohydrate. And finally, how many of those carbs were stored as fat? The word lipogenesis contains two words, lipo meaning lipid or fat, and genesis meaning the creation of. Lipogenesis is a scientific way to describe fat storage. This is pretty amazing stuff. Despite eating nearly double the amount of carbohydrate we would normally consume in one day, that is 275 grams, the research subjects converted no carbohydrate to fat, i.e. eating carbs will not make you fat. This same research group came back a few years later and said, okay, we know that eating a massive amount of carbohydrate for one day won't make us fat, but what if we do it over the course of several days? If you train your eyes to the blue shaded numbers below the graph, you will see the grams of carbohydrate consumed per day in this research study. During the first three days, the subjects consumed 42, 56, and 52 grams of carbohydrate. During the fourth day, they consumed a whopping 757 grams of carbohydrate. And you can see that after consuming that massive amount of carbohydrate, the subjects burned or oxidized a considerable amount of carbohydrate. And they also stored a considerable amount as glycogen. But they did not store any carbohydrate as fat until the following day, when the subjects consumed an additional mind-blowing 834 grams of carbohydrate. Thereafter, the subjects continued to eat an insane amount of carbohydrate over the next several days. Carbohydrate storage capacity maxed out, and in this case, carbohydrate had to be stored as fat. Before we move on, I want to reemphasize how ridiculous it would be in everyday life to consume over 800 grams of carbohydrate in one day, let alone day after day after day. To give you some perspective, if you were to eat an entire loaf of bread, jar of jam, and drink an entire 60 ounce container of orange juice, you would only be consuming 
808 grams of carbohydrate. That's far less than several of the days in the research study. Ultimately, whether you're consuming carbohydrates, fats, or proteins, it still all boils down to energy balance. If you eat too much of anything, and that means carbs, fats, or proteins, it'll be stored as fat. However, even if your diet consisted of nearly 100% carbohydrate, provided you are in energy balance, you will not gain or lose weight. This type of diet would be completely impractical and difficult to attain, but I'm trying to emphasize the point here. Energy balance determines whether you gain or lose weight, not the amount of carbs you consume. We'll get back to this concept in a bit, but the next concept I would like to share with you now is the oxidative hierarchy. The oxidative hierarchy, along with energy balance, determines what we store and what we burn. The oxidative hierarchy is a process the body uses to determine the order that fuels are burned and is based upon how much of each fuel the body can store. For example, there's no storage form of alcohol, so if you consume alcohol with your meal, your body will burn that fuel first. Protein is next. Your body can't really store protein. Your body is made of protein, we build structures, enzymes, and muscles with protein, but we don't actually store any protein for future use. Carbohydrates are then burned next, and fats are burned last. If you recall from earlier, the body can store close to 600 grams of carbohydrate. Whereas your ability to store fat is virtually unlimited. We have provided an estimate of the amount of fat stored in a 140 pound individual, but this is by no means this individual storage capacity. We can store millions of calories of fat. The way that I like to think about fat and carbohydrate oxidation is that fat is the king and carbohydrate are the pawns. The pawns are protecting the king and the more carbohydrate you eat, the more protection the king has. You must get rid of the pawns before you can get to the king. If carbohydrate is available to the body, the body is going to burn carbohydrate. Fat is a reserve fuel and your body has no intentions of using any of its reserves if it doesn't have to. As we saw earlier, carbs are not converted to fat unless you eat massive amounts of carbohydrates day after day after day. But carbs are protecting your fat stores. If carbohydrate is available to the body, the body is going to burn carbohydrate. A study published 20 years ago now showed this very thing. Fat oxidation is not sensitive to dietary fat intake, i.e., it doesn't matter how much fat you eat. Eating more fat will not cause you to burn more fat. The body is going to preferentially burn carbs before it burns fat. You must get rid of the carbs to get to the fat. And here is another study stating the same thing. The results demonstrate that the rates of fat and of carbohydrate oxidation are not influenced by the fat content of a meal. I could show study after study after study showing the same thing, but I think you get the point. So your next question should be, so how do I utilize what I've learned in this video to lose unwanted weight? You have two primary options. Option one is that you eat less fat so that you have less fat for your body to burn or store, or eat less carbs so that you can get rid of the pawns and force your body to burn the fat. Option two is to burn more calories through exercise. And of course, your third and best option is to perform a combination of all three. Weight gain, weight loss, and weight maintenance really all boils down to energy balance. In weight maintenance, we are likely burning a mixture of carbs and fat. In weight gain, you are likely burning more carbs than you are fat. And in weight loss, you are removing the pawns and burning more fat than carbs. Yet another way to look at the fuel mixture pawn versus king relationship is to view it graphically. The figure I'm about to show you is a figure that I made up and is an oversimplification of metabolism, but it does demonstrate some key relationships. To orient you to this graph, the blue shaded region on the top half of the graph represents burning carbohydrate, and the bottom red shaded region of the graph represents burning fat. The deeper you get into each region, the more of that fuel you're burning. At rest, we are always burning a mixture of fats and carbs, but the shaded regions represent the predominant fuel source being utilized. The bottom x-axis represents the time of day, and the key on the right-hand side of the graph represents what happens to fat and carbohydrate metabolism during the day 
when you are in a positive or negative energy balance. We will start off by talking about what happens during a positive energy balance before talking about what happens during a negative energy balance. Let's say you eat breakfast containing carbohydrate at 6 a.m. Carbohydrate oxidation immediately increases to burn through the carbs you consumed in your breakfast. The higher the line goes, the more heavily we are relying on carbohydrate as a fuel. After several hours have passed, the carbohydrates you ingested for breakfast have either been stored or oxidized and carbohydrate oxidation decreases. When you eat another meal containing carbs at lunchtime, carbohydrate oxidation again increases to burn through your newly ingested carbs. I want you to notice that in this example we are eating again before we ever got into the fat burning zone. This is a hallmark of a positive energy balance. After several hours have passed, the carbohydrates you ingested have either been stored or oxidized and carbohydrate oxidation decreases. When we eat dinner at 6 o'clock or 6.30, carbohydrate oxidation increases again. Hopefully from this graph you can see that when we eat too many calories and are in a positive energy balance, we never really burn all that much of our stored fat, i.e. we don't get to our fat stores before eating again. Now on the other hand, using the same meal patterns of breakfast, lunch, and dinner, let's see what happens when we eat less food and are in a negative energy balance. When we eat less calories and less carbs for breakfast, carbohydrate oxidation still increases, but not to the degree that it does in a positive energy balance when you're consuming more calories and more carbs. Your body quickly burns or stores the carbohydrates you ingested for breakfast, and in a matter of only a couple of hours, you are burning predominantly fat from your fat stores. You have removed the pawns and are now able to get to the king. When you eat your lunch at noon, carbohydrate oxidation will rapidly increase, but again, provided you stay in a negative energy balance and do not eat too many calories or too many carbs, the peak and the duration of your carbohydrate oxidation will not come anywhere close to that seen in a positive energy balance. Before you know it, you're back into the fat burning zone. When you eat dinner at 6 or 6.30, carbohydrate oxidation will again increase. There are millions of variations of meal patterns, macronutrient percentages consumed, and quantity of food consumed, but the premise remains the same. If you eat carbohydrate, your body will burn carbohydrate. Your body won't turn carbohydrate into fat, even if you consume a massive amount of carbohydrate. But you must remember that carbohydrate will protect fat stores, and that eating too many calories of any type will cause you to gain weight. I'm not scared of carbs, and you shouldn't be scared of carbs either. But if you're trying to lose weight, or eat healthy for that matter, it's important not to eat too many carbs or too much fat. Eating carbs will not make you fat unless you eat too many calories as well. From this video, one might get the impression that I'm an advocate of a high protein diet. I'm not an advocate for or against any one diet type, but I do recommend not wasting your calories on excess fat or excess carbohydrate. Again, this is Todd Weber of Energy Balanced Nutrition Consulting, and I'd like to thank you for watching this video. If you have any health and wellness questions that you'd like to have answered, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I hope you have a great day.